Discussions in this show should not be construed as specific recommendations or investment advice. Always consult with your investment professional before making important investment decisions. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research Incorporated, a registered broker-dealer, member FINRA SIPC, investment advisor representative, Cambridge Investment Research Advisors Incorporated, a registered investment advisor, financial planning services through Andover Advisory Group, a registered investment advisor, Cambridge and Andover Advisory Group are not affiliated. Cambridge does not offer tax or legal advice. Good morning, Justin. Right. I want to thank you for your hard work. The, uh, the information uh, is, is a big help, and I appreciate what you did. Enjoy the show. All right. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's great to know. Thank you for the information. You're very welcome. Okay, Jeff. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You're right on the money there, Jeff. How are you doing this morning? Thank you. Well, those are good questions. Hopefully, hopefully I have them. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. You're very welcome. You're going to hear stuff here that you, you don't hear anywhere else on, on radio. And, and don't forget it. Welcome to another still unsanitized edition of Talk Money. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if this is your first visit, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jeffrey Shank. I'm a chartered financial consultant and owner of Andover Advisory Group, a registered investment advisor. And we are here uh, weekly on Monday mornings to uh, talk about the financial news uh, of the day, of the week, and uh, uh, talk about personal financial planning, give you some tips and um, how to um, help make your uh, personal financial situation a little bit better. And ultimately, our goal here is to improve your money IQ. And um, low, uh, it's the um, 18th of January, 2021, and we have yet to talk about those uh, uh, Wall Street axioms, those um, oh, yeah, yeah. stock market indicators that we usually talk about at the beginning of the year, like the January barometer, um, and of course, the, uh, the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl indicator. Super Bowl indicator, right? Yeah. yeah. And we haven't talked about it largely because... They're pretty much useless. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but we like to illustrate how useless they are. <laughs> we do like to illustrate that, yes. Um, should we add, besides unsanitized, should we add non-insurrected or non-insurrected non or non <laughs> whatever the verb would be or the adjective yeah, would the be? The adjective would be, yeah. yeah. Um, perhaps. Maybe, maybe we should. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, um, it's funny because I was talking to... Um, uh, somebody, you know, uh, an attorney. <laughs> oh, yes. And, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that we're talking about the uh, events. We haven't talked in a while. And um, he pointed out that um, uh, using that that term seemed to uh, uh, didn't didn't properly describe uh, what was what was what was happening in under described it. Uh, no, thought? over over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Over just over described it. Yeah. Well, no, it's less that insurrection over describes it. It's less that it's more that people don't understand the um, definition of insurrection. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Initially, I mean, because the, a, the autonomous zone in Portland would be an insurrection. The occupation of the Wisconsin capital would be the we're insurrection. Would exactly. Be an because insurrection it's simil well. similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I said initially it was described as a, as a coup. Um, yes. Yeah, which, which is, and I've heard the sedition word, which is, is sedition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. what I said was, Hey, if this was, if this was a coup, uh, they would have showed up with, <laughs> with tanks and automatic weapons, not, <laughs> not flagpoles. <laughs> and this zip, picture, and zip ties, right? There's this picture of this woman who I can only imagine as a school teacher yes. in her, in her mid sixties yes. with, with her hair up in a bun and a Dunkin' Donuts cup. Walking through the halls, like, oh, yeah, the, there's your coup. There's your coup, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was like they, they, um, like a dog that catches up with the car, right? <laughs> <laughs> they got in. Yeah. Now what? Now, now what do we do? Well, you know what they did? They took pictures. <laughs> yeah, took photos. Yeah, <laughs> took photos of themselves, selfies. Yeah. Smart move. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they could have, they could have kept their masks on. Yeah. And at least minimize the chances that they would get get caught. But they're just like waving at waving at the cameras and stuff. And as soon as I, I saw that, immediately when I saw that, I said, "Facial recognition." I wonder yeah. how that's going. Well, to these people weren't thinking they were part of an insurrection. <laughs> exactly. They were thinking they're getting a special yeah. tour. I, would, I, I think it more pro properly describes the riot. Not to not to diminish uh, what 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 happened 
um, yeah, because yeah. five people. No, uh, I don't diminish five what people perished, you know, and so uh, it's unacceptable. Oh, yeah, una totally unacceptable. Yeah. So, uh, but we still need an accurate representation of of the events. Not going not to happen. I know. <laughs> <laughs> not just happen. me getting loopy on a Monday morning. Yeah. Um, so um, January barometer, for example, says that the first day of uh, January will uh, first trading day, first business day of January will will determine how the week, how the first week might go, and how the first week oh, might okay. go will determine. Uh, how the rest of the month might go, and, uh, and the, so and four o'clock, the first day of the market, we can close up shop. We're, basically, we're well, yeah, you just yeah, right, ignore it for the rest of the year. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and um, how January goes, so goes the rest of the year. Is is the yeah. uh, uh, is the axiom January barometer, um, and that has proven true unless the AFC wins, <laughs> the old unless AFL wins. The old AFL uh, win, yeah. wins the uh, Super Bowl. So the Super Bowl indicator. Mm -hmm. um, somebody did some research back in the uh, back in the seventies, and they said, "Look at this correlation between who wins the Super Bowl and the, how the market does that that particular year. There must be some there must be something up, right?" And um, the um, and how it how it goes is that um, if the uh, old NFL, a team from the old NFL before the merger. Mm -hmm um wins the wins the super bowl well that's gonna that's gonna determine uh how the market's gonna go and if um if the if the old NF, nfl uh, team wins then it's gonna be a good year okay uh if, yeah. it, if if the alternate is true traditional stodgy yeah yeah the traditional old NFL. Stodgy, yeah, yeah exactly the old nfl yeah so i was just thinking about it uh before we but if uh, the insurrectionists win the, the afl <laughs> so, <laughs> so i was just thinking i was just thinking about it if uh if tom brady goes on to uh win uh when a uh, when a Super Bowl uh, in in twenty twenty one, that I assume that the Tampa Bay Bucks are considered a um, an expansion team. Yeah, right? they're, they're not weren't old they, NFL. Weren't they part of the um, uh, the AFC at one time initially? No. when they first when no, they, no. I thought that they were. Are you sure? No. The, now that you now you say that with such certainty, I'm, no, I'm not sure. But. I, yeah, I thought that they were part of the AFC and then went to the, went I'll to the NFC. But yeah, we could check that out. Um, the Steelers and the Colts. Switch leagues. Yes. Oh, the Steelers did. I didn't know the Steelers did. Yeah, Steelers yeah. were. In oh, NFL they were part of the old NFL, right? Mm -hmm. Now the AFC. And so, yeah, it's funny because they've they've changed. They they have modified this this right. uh, uh, indicator, the Super Bowl indicator, to be more of a AFC NFC thing uh, uh, as of late. But again, totally worthless in my opinion. Oh, well, we're going to get an AFL team for certain. Well, we might not get an old NFL team, but we'll get an old AFL team for certain. In the Super Bowl, yeah, but not necessarily the winner. Not necessarily because there's the winner, still right. there's still yeah. uh, teams from the old NFL that 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 are uh, right. right Packers, Packers yeah. Uh, yeah. being yeah 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 yeah. So um, to totally. Wait a second. What happens if the Packers win, which they had quite often in the past? They're they're a security. Packers are a publicly owned team. They're actually part of the market. It's funny. I haven't looked at the stock price lately, but. Yeah. Um, that's more of a novelty than yeah, it is a real good I investment. To be quite honest with you, <laughs> but you're right. One of the few to its quality. One of the an few professional uh, uh, sports teams that actually um, uh, went. Uh, did they go actually go public? Is it publicly traded? You know, no. Or is it privately? No, held? I think it's privately held. It's, I think they're issuing their own. Yeah. So in interestingly enough, Lou, uh, we have just led ourselves to the topic that I wanted to talk about today, and and uh, it's what we do. Yeah, because we had a pretty good market last year, despite the pandemic. Kind of, uh, uh, kind of a uh, something that I think a lot of people wouldn't have anticipated, uh, depending on which index you're looking at. Anywhere well, from what 15 if I to told, a, what if I told you at the beginning of the, beginning of the year the government was going to dump uh, what 1.5 trillion into the economy uh, in the form of uh, stimulus? You mean? Yeah, it's more than that. Is it? No, in it's total. It's close to four trillion dollars. Close to four. Yeah. If you include the last, the, the last installment, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And now they're talking about another two trill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, hey, here you go. Um, but you're right. If if you told if if you um, had told me in this time last year that the that the um, federal government would have um, sent two thousand dollar checks to, to everybody, I. Might have thought that that, but I wonder why they would be doing yes. that, and and then and and then I would would assume that there was something bad going, uh, bad 
uh, occurring that would be a negative for the market, not a positive for the market. But mm -hmm. couple that with what the uh, Federal Reserve is doing in terms of uh, increasing the money supply and uh, keeping interest rates low. That's pretty much what has fueled the uh, the stock market over the over the past year. Um, and um, I mean, the, the Federal Reserve is not necessarily putting the money directly into the stock market, but they're keeping interest rates so low that that money is flowing up, uh, essentially flowing into the uh, right into the stock market in various ways. Um, and um, it was um, it was interesting because I was looking at IPOs, initial public offerings, an acronym IPO for initial public offering. And I was looking at what happened last year in terms of IPOs, and you would have thought that companies would have been, would have pulled back a little bit, but um, the IPO market was as hot as it was the prior year, mm -hmm. and it's starting out similarly. And um, I read this, I, I, I read this. Um, this article, and I just wanted to, to quote to quote from it because I was thinking about this. Um, why bother with track records and sound business plans? <laughs> and don't even think about revenues, assets, and profits. Fledgling entrepreneurs are getting rich simply by taking their startups public, routinely doubling and tripling the paper worth of untried companies. Lou. Think uh, of that sentence, huh? Let, let's just reread that sentence. Which one? The last one? <laughs> yeah. Routinely paper doubling. Worth. Routinely doubling and tripling the paper worth of, of untried companies. The paper worth of untried companies. Yeah. So, yeah. Lou, that is actually an article that was written and published in Vanity Fair in the year 2000, January. Wow. January of 2000. Again, I was thinking about what's happening in the stock market today. Yep. Thinking about the IPO market and what ha what we've seen in terms of IPOs because these companies are, are, are um, starting to trade um, uh, at double their initial offering price. Right. And it reminded me of 1999. And at the time, I thought maybe we're I- were partying like it's 1999? You were partying like it's 1999, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, at the time, uh, I thought maybe I was uneducated <laughs> and didn't understand uh, what was going on in the what they call the new the new economy, and it was the the dot com yeah. era, and companies were going public with little or no profits. Uh, in many cases, um, significant yeah. losses, and uh, people were gobbling up these uh, these these shares of these new companies. They were a little more than an idea or a little more than, a, you know, a, Yeah, a they might have had they yeah. might have had a year under their belt. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe uh, just a, a couple of initial uh, uh, funding rounds. That's a little bit different today. There's no question about it. But it is it just feels similar. And when you think about some of the things that we look at, the January barometer or the or the Super Bowl indicator, you know what can we learn from from the uh, from the past? Uh, and I look at the dot com era and the dot com bubble, and I say, are we at that point again? Yeah, where some of these valuations just don't make any sense. And so, uh, for 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 our uh, for our audience, let me just um, take a moment and just talk about what we're what we're referring to here. And what an IPO is, initial public offering. That's where a company decides for a lot of reasons that they want to sell their stock and make it available generally to the public. Right. Prior to that, it was privately held. And there might have been um, some public investors, but the company itself was still held privately by those individuals and it wasn't traded openly on a, on a stock market. Right. And so the primary reason why um, companies go public is because they want to raise some money and um, they are able to sell either create additional shares or sell shares that are in there uh, in, in, in the treasury and they can uh, raise capital by, selling those shares 
to to the general public. Mm -hmm. Now, the existing shareholders also can offer their shares uh, for sale. Uh, but of course, depending on how that um, stock trades, when it does go public, will determine the value of those who already own shares that have already been part of the ownership of the privately held the privately held company, right? right? Yep. Um, and you 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 may wonder why companies um, can decide. You tell me, can, can you? I, I think you just started on it, but yeah. can you a little bit more on how many share? How they determine how many shares? They just figure. They just come up with a number. Yeah, they'll just say, "Hey, look." We, and then this twenty percent is... only gets twenty percent of that shares of those shares that they decided to sell. No. 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 So somebody who is already an existing shareholder has the opportunity to buy additional shares if they want to, but they, they, they already own, they own it, already own a, a, um, a piece of the company. Yes. And so the company itself has the ability to e issue new shares as part of an initial public offering I see. or has held back shares that they've already issued, but haven't sold to an individual investor. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they issue an amount of shares before they go public. The company already, already has shares already issued. Has shares. Already have yeah. right, exactly. But when they when they go public, they yep. say, "Hey, look, we have these shares, in addition to all the shares we have outstanding, to offer to the to offer to the public." And again, it's a way to raise capital. Yeah. And it's a cheap way to raise capital because all you get as an investor is an ownership interest in the company, right? right? It's uh, if you borrowed that money from a bank, for example, you'd have to pay it back at some point plus interest. Right. Whereas this, there's no promise that you're going to pay anything back. Only what that owner, the the um, the shareholder now has a claim on the income or dividend uh, or, or profits of right. the company in the form of dividends if it's if it's paid out. Right. Yep. Now, there's a lot of there's there's many ways to go public, but um, the, mo the most traditional way is where. Um, they um, file a, a uh, with the SEC and say, "Hey, on this day, we're going to offer these shares for to, to the uh, to the public." Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the IPO price is the price that that someone gets who's basically an insider, either already owns shares, as you mentioned before, or maybe a a relative or employee of the of the company, a preferred investor, and a lot of times what happens is the company goes out to big financial firms, brokerage firms, and says, "Hey, look, we want to allocate this number of shares to you and to your clients so that they they can buy it." Yeah. And and who is the big financial firm going to offer those shares to? They're going to offer them to their best their best clients. Right. Right. Yep. And so. Um, usually when the general public, the average person has an opportunity to buy into these, into these companies, it's on the day it starts trading publicly. You're not getting, if you do that, if you buy it at, on the first minute that is, that is trading, you're not buying in at the IPO price, right? You're buying in at the new market price, market price. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that is what is talked about when you hear the news about a new company that just went public is that jump yep. in that first day of trading where it, it, it went public at $30, but now it's trading at 70 at 75. So just because you bought it at 75 doesn't mean you made any money. Right. Right. Yeah. You're you, ha it has to go up from there for you to make any money. Yes. But the people who were the insiders that already held shares or were able to buy these shares at the publicly at the IPO initial public offering price, right? Right. They made a lot of money. They made a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And again, who do those shares go to? Those are going to the big financial firms that are helping to to uh, help underwrite the uh, the initial public offering, right. and also and to their preferred customers. Yeah. Right. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because they want to reward those customers for being a customer. Yes. Right. Yeah. Nothing illegal about it, just the way right. just the way it works. So the average person is not going to get an allocation or have access to. Now there are other ways that you can that companies do go public where um, they make it uh, more generally available to the to the um, uh, to the public. Uh, a direct listing is an example of that, um, and these um, what they call SPACs, which are already companies 
that are trading publicly, but they are going out and acquiring other companies. And then there's a way for the general public to, to take advantage of it. But um, we get we, we hear all this hype around uh, around IPOs and people start thinking about these companies that they do business with and and the opportunity to make a make a ton of money and they all pile in. Yeah. And this is what happened back in in uh, uh, 2000, basically. Um, people were piling into these IPOs that had no profits at all. Right. Uh, and uh, were just way over overvalued uh, in terms of its uh, of its market price. And a lot of people got hurt now. And I just want to mention one other thing. And I think this is really important. Um, when you own a stock, right, you you have you have that ownership interest. If you sell it, it doesn't it doesn't go away. You're selling it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. In the end, all the shares outstanding by a particular mm -hmm. company have to be owned by somebody. Right. Yep. And so if the market starts to turn on you and you decide that you want to sell, well, there has to be somebody out there willing to buy that's willing to buy. Yeah. And otherwise you go down with the ship. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, you could be that, that person who is left holding that share of that company with nobody who wants, nobody who wants to, to buy it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, that actually happens a lot of times in a, um, and I can think of one, I won't mention the name of the company, but um, it felt that the IPO fell on its face. Um, if that gives you any indication as to, as to the uh, IPO. Um, but. Um, oh, I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to give you a second Sorry. to think. Yeah. I wanted to give you a second to Sorry, think about it. Sorry, I a second to catch up. Um, and so what ended up happening is mm -hmm. that um, the, the, um, the price, didn't go up when it started trading publicly. Yeah, it was delayed for a long period of time. The price didn't go up from its initial uh, public offering price, and so what ended up happening is the big financial firms, the big brokerage firms, they started buying back the shares from people yeah. to keep the to keep the price up because they wanted the price to stay at least at or above its initial public offering price. It didn't it didn't stay that way for a while. <laughs> not to not just you know it it has turned out to be if you were a long term holder a pretty good yeah. pretty good investment. But at the time. It just it looked like it was a failure, uh, unfortunately. So you want to be careful, I guess, about um, hearing about these new companies that are going public and then just you know wanting to wanting to buy into them because we could have a situation like we had in two thousand, where a lot of these companies that really didn't deserve the price that they were being given, but just because of the the uh, the hype around it and the excitement around it, that people wanted to own it because they wanted that they thought that that would be the next big big thing and they could make you know they could double or triple their money can i ask you i, I don't want to ambush you with a question but i'm gonna, yeah, gonna ask you anyway let's try the dot-com bubble um it's a it's a similar situation we're in where the value of stocks is asset, equities is basically overvalued at this point right a little bit uh, that's it's a matter of opinion Luke. matter of opinion and it's what makes a market yeah I, sh I should say but in my opinion, I think we're, we're, we're extreme, in some cases, extremely rich valuations. What imploded the dot-com bubble? In other words, was it the market coming to its senses? Was there a black swan event? How did, how did the dot-com bubble end up collapsing? Well, uh, uh, essentially, it was. I think it was people coming to their senses okay. and realizing that this is just not. And there was a couple of of, of um, bankruptcies that, that led into it, I think. And then once the exodus starts, it tends to snowball. It's like a trap door. Yeah. And it's almost important. And, and again, so you're holding on to that, uh, to those shares. Yeah. And you're realizing the price goes down. And if you're not watching the market um, constantly on a daily basis, yep. you, you hear the news and, oh, wait a second. And you go to check the price and you, oh, wow. And then you panic and you try to, and you try to sell it, but there's nobody out there that wants to buy it. And the price just keeps going down. Yeah. Hmm. So at what point are we going to come to our senses in this market? I, all I'm saying is yeah. I don't know, and I'm not making any predictions. Yeah, right. I'm just saying that there's a lot of companies that went public last year that are going, that that early this year already just in the first three weeks of the year have have uh, gone public, and it's almost like they're rushing to 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 uh, to to, to um, um, yeah get into the market and raise and raise that capital. And you you look at the financials and you say, really, 
Yeah. And I'm, and I'm starting to think that maybe I'm an idiot and I don't, <laughs> I don't recognize, you know, right. the, these, uh, the new way of thinking and the new, the new way, the new economics, I guess. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and the other thing I want that, that I think is very, very important, and this is going to get to, to a, uh, uh, a subject that we, we want to talk about more on the, uh, on future, um, episodes of the show, um, is that the, the, um, if you look at the indexes and how well they did last year in 2020 and starting out the year, you know, positively anyway, um, those increases, the indexes, um, you can trace back to just a handful of, of stocks within the, within the index. Yeah. And, and that's a problem. People are thinking the market in general is floating, but it's, but when you more look specific about right. and, several, and so when you dig into the to to the uh, to the rest of the those those names, the, the rest of those companies that are within the index, you find that there isn't a lot there there. Yeah. Um, in terms of over, but now that could create some opportunities. I'm not saying that that's all bad necessarily, but here's the problem: if you're an index investor, you're a passive investor, and you're and you're counting on the indexes. Once those once those um, the, those names, those few, those select names that brought the index up, they could easily. Yep. bring the index down yep. again. And so I'd say that for 2021, I think it becomes more of a, uh, I think you have to be careful about the investments that you're making. And if you're planning on using indexes as a, um, as a way to invest, that could be, that could be a mistake in, tw in 2021. Hmm. So, Hey, um, we should take a, we should take a quick break here. Uh, I do want to give everybody an update on what the IRS uh, is, uh, is saying about uh, tax filing season. Um, and, um, I also want to get back to some of the, uh, pitfalls, uh, financial pitfalls that you should avoid in 2021. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Whether you're saving money for your children's education, preparing for retirement, or deciding on the right life insurance plan, you can count on the professionals at Andover Advisory Group. Established in 1996, our company is responsible for providing financial planning services to individuals seeking sound financial advice. We create a comprehensive financial plan that serves as a framework for organizing the pieces of your financial life so that you can focus on your goals and understand what it takes to reach them. And a financial plan can help you prioritize. For example, how saving for college might impact your ability to save for your retirement. Having a clear perspective will allow you to pick the right strategies and confidently choose suitable products and services. Best of all, you'll have the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your financial life is on track. Call us at 978-691-5005 to book your free initial consultation. That's 978-691-5005. Hi, this is Jeffrey Shank, a chartered financial consultant and the host of the Talk Money Show. I've been helping my clients for more than 30 years, and now I'm going to help you. Join us to learn about the financial issues that concern you the most. You'll hear from the experts on a range of topics, get some great ideas, and it's all designed to help you make more out of your money. So tune in to Talk Money right here on Eagle News Radio. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Money. So the uh, IRS uh, announced just recently uh, that um, the they're going to push back the start of the tax filing season. Really? Um, yeah. They want to hold uh, on to some withholdings <laughs> a little longer? <laughs> no. This from the IRS. Yeah. Planning for the nation's filing season process is a massive undertaking. Oh, I can imagine. And IRS teams have been working nonstop to prepare to prepare for this, as well as delivering economic impact payments <laughs> in record time. They which say. they did very efficiently. One of the most efficient which, government programs I've ever which seen. Which is scary. Yeah. Low. Okay. Now, um, lawmakers. It's like they didn't have to check their app. <laughs> <laughs> lawmakers have the ability to just like switch on this spigot and yeah. and put money in people's accounts now that they now that they know that they can do it yep efficiently and and they get a nice round of applause for and they $600 get a, exactly yeah. yeah yeah and they're talking about another 
fourteen hundred dollars to top it off. So I just a lot. I, I think there might be some confusion as to how this is going because they were talking about two thousand payments. Yeah. They sent out six hundred dollars payments per person, and now they're talking about two thousand. This is not two thousand on top of the six hundred. Right. What they're talking about is fourteen hundred added to the to the uh, to the six hundred. Right. Because two thousand on top of the six hundred would break them. <laughs> um, IRS Commissioner Chuck uh, Reddick. And I'm assuming I'm assuming that Chuck is going to be gone uh, with the new with the new administration, but I'm not sure. Um, given the pandemic, this is one of the nation's most important filing seasons ever. So why is Chuck issuing statements? <laughs> Don't know. Chuck should be on a beach somewhere. <laughs> you would think. Screw the maybe, preparation. Screw maybe the he won't be gone for the tax season. Maybe he won't. I'm out of maybe here. he won't be gone. But maybe he's yeah. he's he's trying to. Maybe it's like the, that. Uh, player that whose whose contract's coming up and you know yep. wants to have a have a real good yep. stat year right yep, yep. <laughs> so he's he's uh he's auditioning for the uh for the job right fair enough um so the start date the new start date february 12th so that's when they're going to start receiving returns they're not going to process anything until february 12th you can start to prepare your return yeah but you're not going to actually be able to file it um so don't file it today looking for a quick return because they're not even going to look at it till until February, February according to this. Yeah. 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 The start date, they said, will ensure that people get their needed tax refunds quickly while also making sure they receive any remaining stimulus payments they are eligible for as quickly as possible. Seems counterintuitive to me. Yeah. Well, again. Yeah. They, you know. they wanted to get their money quickly. They would have been processing returns now. <laughs> that, that was the emphasis of the program. <laughs> not while they're trying to send out uh, they're probably anticipating another uh, economic stimulus payment too. Think about that, right? Yeah. So, so my guess is the economic stimulus payment, if it is, if it is eventually uh, voted on and and approved, mm -hmm. um, and we're still in the early stages of all of that, right? Yeah. Plus, we've got an impeachment trial that that um, might divert <laughs> their attention. Um, no, it probably won't. Took the took the house like two hours to get this done, so <laughs> won't won't delay them too much. <laughs> <laughs> um we're doing this stuff very efficiently now <laughs> <laughs> yeah good point yeah well they 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 have to they have to get in and get out before anybody uh <laughs> insurrects yeah <laughs> um and so i lost my i lost I, 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 that's okay yeah yeah um what are we talking about we're talking they're, about they're the, anticipating uh, a stimulus oh right exactly which indicates so, so, that the, this bill right. is going to get done before Probably at the beginning of February. I'm not saying that they are. That's not in the statement. I'm just saying that, that they're probably going to have to. We're putting. The although maybe together. it's just maybe it's just one person now that that can do this, right? They can just. <laughs> they got a button. <laughs> it's Joe. Joe, send out those payments, will you? Okay. There's like a launch code and there's, there's a, a payment launch code. code. <laughs> you need two people. You need a payment key. code. Yeah, two people with the key. Different locks. <laughs> I don't even think they need that much. Yeah. Um, so now this is good news. If we put the pieces together, this means that. Fourteen hundred dollars should be coming before February twelfth. Does suggest that, right? It does. That they're anticipating that might be the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, to speed refunds, the IRS uh, urges taxpayers to file electronically with direct deposit as soon as they have the information they need. So they're saying that yes, you should file as soon as you have the information you need. But at the same time, they're saying that they're not going to they're not actually going to process these yeah. things until February twelfth. So I don't know what happens actually. If you start to, I, I know what happens on our end. They're going to say, "Hey, you can't submit these for for filing until February 12th." So that's what we're going to get. Oh, really? Right? That's what they're going to tell think us. So? Yeah. yeah. So that doesn't prevent us from from preparing the return. Right. We just won't be able to push the button and submit the electronic filing until that happens. So, so if you my file guess now, is, you don't even get in line for it first. You can't file now. You cannot. Well, we yeah. won't be able to. I'm not sure. It's, it's Individuals. Saying, yeah. Well, it, it's saying that you can file electronically and there are some free file uh, uh, options for you that you, can, that you can utilize for people who don't have very complex uh, tax returns. Um, and so I'm not sure if, if you can actually push the button and they'll say, hey, you know, just so you know, this is not going to get processed till February 12th. Or if they say, wait a second, you can't submit this until February 12th, come back. I see. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure exactly how that's all going to work. We will update you as this, uh, as we get more information. Um, but um, I, I do want to mention that if you are the type of person who likes to uh, file your return yourself, there's, there's a lot of options out there. If it's a, if it's a real simple payment, there's a lot of free file things you can, you can do. Um, 
but if you're um, if you have you know dividends or um, investment uh, gains, uh, taxable capital gains, or if you're self-employed, a lot of these free file systems don't work. So right. you can still use an online service uh, to to uh, file your tax return uh, yourself. Um, and we actually have one that we recommend uh, to our clients who are do-it-yourselfers. And the reason is because it really turns out to be um, one of the cheapest ways to do this. Uh, a lot of these services out there, they say, oh, you can file for free and you get on, you start putting your information in. Oh, wait a second. You know, if you're itemizing, it's gonna you're itemizing yeah. or if you have self-employment income or something like that. Oh, it's going to cost you this. So it's sort of a bait and switch, but um, I'm not going to I'm not going to yeah. um, um, be too, too critical about that. Um, but we we recommend a, a, a service uh, and it's it's a twenty five dollar flat fee. Mm -hmm. That's it. No matter how, how complex your, your situation is, all the all the form all the forms are there and it includes state filing too. Oh. That's the other thing that they get you on. Yeah. So they say, Oh yeah, you can file your federal return. Oh, you want to file a state return? Oh, it's yeah. gonna cost you this, <laughs> right? So it's twenty five dollars covers um the um uh, federal return, uh multiple state returns, if you have multiple state returns, uh self employed individual dividends, capital gains, whatever, it's all there. And um, did we resolve the commuter tax thing? Commuter tax in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, Massachusetts oh. tax oh, I, telecommuters. I, 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 my guess is that that uh, that will um, uh, come up um, in when tax returns start to get filed, and the and the uh, Department of uh, Revenue in Massachusetts starts to push back yeah. on taxpayers, saying that hey, wait a second. Uh, this is Massachusetts source income. You're saying that you work from 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 home, but it wasn't at the uh, 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 request of your uh, uh, of your company. Now, how does it work? Um, the convenience of the company. I forget exactly what the yeah. how, what, uh, um, yeah. what the definition is, but bottom line is, the state of Massachusetts is going to lose a lot of revenue if people who live in New Hampshire who normally pay Massachusetts state taxes are going to ex try to exempt themselves. Um, but no, you close was, the border. That's so what happens. When you say has it been resolved, I don't <laughs> yeah. think there was any proactive um, uh, um, legislation or or um, negotiations or anything with w between yep. the the the, the, uh, the two states, um, except that the governor has said that um, he wants to protect New Hampshire residents who are working in working from home yeah. and uh, try to. Uh, exempt their income from uh, Massachusetts state tax. So we probably won't know until it actually starts to starts to happen. Um, so um, again, this this um, uh, um, this tax preparation um, system that you can do online, it's, it's all all uh, secure, private, um, and you can get there uh, by going to our website. It's andoveradvisorygroup.com. Um, and if you just look on the left-hand column, scroll down to the bottom, it says um, file, your, file your tax return. You click on that link. Or we do have a um, neat little um, uh, QR code that you can, that you can use. Um, and it's, um, did, you, did you put it up, Lou? It's up. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you could just, all you have to do is just, you, you should be able to just scan that. Take your phone and scan it. Take your phone, scan that QR code, and it'll bring you right, it'll bring you right to the site. So we'll leave, leave that up for the rest of this, uh, mm -hmm. this segment. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, two things. One, the, uh, economic impact payment. Uh, the IRS says that they sent out millions of payments via debit card. Yeah. So if you were expecting it to get deposited into your bank account for some reason, it's possible that the IRS actually sent you not a check, but a plastic card yeah uh in the form of a debit card for you for you to uh, use which by the way doesn't have to be used to purchase something you can actually just uh use it to and transfer the money into your into your bank account or that's the way it worked the last time around yep right um and i guess it's just a one-time use once you've used all the money that's on the card basically uh throw it out yep. i would recommend somehow destroying it um just for safety's sake and um, so be on the lookout. If you haven't got your economic impact payment yet, 
you're expecting one. It's possible that it came in the mail. It might have looked like one of those credit card offers. Yeah. And you might have said, forget this and threw it in the trash cans. Go go back in, look through the <laughs> trash can, see if it's there. Wow. <laughs> if not, okay. you'll still you'll still be able to to uh, to get it. Uh, last time around, they were actually um, issuing new debit cards if you uh, if it didn't come or you destroyed it. I don't know how they're doing it this time around, but that's a possibility. Um, and don't forget what a mess that's going to be. And don't forget that if you are entitled to it, you didn't get it for some reason. Oh yeah, one other thing: uh, the uh, the IRS um, said that uh, so if if um, they tried to deposit your money, they're not going to send you an economic. They're not going to send you a debit card. Okay. Yep. They're just going to you're going to. You're you're out of luck. If they and wash if you their close, hands of it, and you, if yeah. you close the account for some reason that they were planning on depositing the money to, then you're you're not going to get a debit card as an alternative. You can't go in and change the bank account right. to another bank account. The only way to take advantage of your um, uh, economic impact payment is to file your tax return and claim it as a rebate. Because basically, what this is, this economic impact payment, is really a, a an advance on a tax credit mm -hmm. for 2020, right? Not for 2021, even though you're getting a payment now, it's really for 2020, okay? Now, with this new round of stimulus that they're talking about, I don't know if it's gonna be 2021 or 2020, that'd be interesting to, yeah. to, uh, to see, but what you do is you file your tax return and then you just tell, you just uh, check off a box that says, no, I didn't get my uh, income, pay um, my uh, advanced um, credit or my economic impact payment, and uh, it'll reduce your overall tax or it'll create a refund. If you had no tax to pay, it'll create a refund and you claim it. That's how you would claim it. Yeah. Sounds like they want to close the books in this 2020. Sounds like they might want to. Yeah. So if it was the first year of my administration, I would want the books to look a little bit better than the 2020 books. Well, you're creating a deficit. So if you're if you're uh, incoming an administration, do you want to show a big deficit? Well, it's on the 2020 year. It's not my year. I oh, inherited that. Well, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. wouldn't you want the new round to be on 2020 instead of? Yeah, exactly. That's instead on, of 2021. I think they're going to push. Yes. Okay. To yeah. make this part. Well, I thought you said close the books on it, and then the new oh, I meant round close the books, in, meaning put this in 2020, put and any then new round, start a new book for any new stimulus payment to yeah. have it on 2020. Yeah. 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 Um, and other, one other thing I wanted to, uh, to mention is that um, for years, the, um, because of electronic filing and the um, uh, insecure nature of it when it was first created, um, a lot of people had their identities yeah. stolen and their tax refunds stolen as a result through the IRS. Yep. Imagine that. I got stories. But we the IRS have... was ravenous and unrelenting in their search to weed out <laughs> these people, right? <laughs> they were giving out billions of dollars yeah. in fraudulent refunds to people. And all you had to do, Lou, all you had to do was just get a Social Security number, throw a bunch of numbers on the uh, on the return and file it and hope for the best. Yep. Yeah. Right? Um, and so the IRS would just see the information on the return, see the tax, the, the, uh, the tax ID number, and they were sending out refunds. In some cases, they were sending out multiple refunds in the form of a check outside the country to the same address. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah. Right. They finally figured out that they <laughs> needed to do something to fix yeah. that. If they wanted people to feel confident about filing their tax returns electronically. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so uh, they came up with a pin program where in order to file your tax return, you have to you have to submit it with a PIN. Um, what a, a personal concept. I, personal identification, <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Yeah. What a concept. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so initially it was only available to those people who actually had their identity stolen, either through a fraudulent tax return or some other method. You right. could actually ask, ask for a PIN. They finally rolled that out so everybody now can get a pin. You absolutely should apply for a pin uh, and utilize that to keep your uh, to keep your information safe. Um, and so the IRS says it's a voluntary program. You have to pass a rigorous identity verification process in order to get it. Spouses, dependents okay. are eligible for a pin. Um, and a pin is valid for a calendar year. 
So you have to renew it every year. That makes sense, pin? doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you'd give them your pin, ask for a new one, basically. Yeah. yeah right. Uh, <clears throat> and they they uh, they recommend that you use the online pin tool to get to get a pin. Sort of. <laughs> to generate a pin for you? They generate a pin. Wow. That's exactly right. Yeah. Four number pin? People can't come up with their own four number pin. Um I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how I don't know how that works. Um I'm I think that they I think that they generate it for you. I don't think that you can you can choose it, but it's possible that you can choose yeah. it. But they but you have to renew it every year. Yeah. That's my point. Right. Um and they also mentioned that the pin tool is offline between November and mid January. So probably won't be able to um uh get your um get your pin just now you might have to wait a little bit longer right it still gives you a month to file because they're not going to look at it till february 12th um still gives you a month to file yeah, yeah. absolutely plenty of time yeah 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 <laughs> and again if you I love a, the way our government works <laughs> again if you're if you're a do-it-yourselfer you you uh like to file your return yourself and um uh you want to try something uh you want to try something different um the, the we recommend this online tool um, and there's a QR code up there that you can uh, use to get there, or you can just go to our website. It's andoveradvisorygroup.com. Um, on the left-hand side, scroll to the bottom. There's a link there to uh, to start your uh, tax return, and it's $25. Yeah. $25, Lou, and it covers everything. You don't have to worry. There's no hidden hidden fees, and you can start your return without actually paying anything. So you don't, you don't pay until you're ready to... Right. You're ready to file, so you can really get an idea and feel for it uh, before you um, before you actually have to file a return. Um, so, uh, with the time we have remaining, I do want to take a quick break, Blue, and and um, when we come back. Uh, we were we talked last week about some of the pitfalls that you should avoid uh, in the in the new year, and we we um, sort of um, sliced it up according to. Um, uh, age category age and we didn't get to the 50s <laughs> we didn't get to those people who you know are 50 in the 50s and 60s and so i wanted to kind of finish that up uh with the, with the uh, few minutes that we have left so please stay tuned we'll be right back whether you're saving money for your children's education preparing for retirement, or deciding on the right life insurance plan, you can count on the professionals at Andover Advisory Group. Established in 1996, our company is responsible for providing financial planning services to individuals seeking sound financial advice. We create a comprehensive financial plan that serves as a framework for organizing the pieces of your financial life so that you can focus on your goals and understand what it takes to reach them. And a financial plan can help you prioritize. For example, how saving for college might impact your ability to save for your retirement. Having a clear perspective will allow you to pick the right strategies and confidently choose suitable products and services. Best of all, you'll have the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your financial life is on track. Call us at 978-691-5005 to book your free initial consultation. That's 978-691-5005. Hi, this is Jeffrey Shank, a chartered financial consultant and the host of the Talk Money Show. I've been helping my clients for more than 30 years, and now I'm going to help you. Join us to learn about the financial issues that concern you the most. You'll hear from the experts on a range of topics, get some great ideas, and it's all designed to help you make more out of your money. So tune in to Talk Money right here on Eagle News Radio. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Money. Hey, so um, I hate Pink Floyd, and this is—I still enjoy this. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> I look forward to this every week. <laughs> the Pink Floyd return. Um, so, uh, before I forget, and I probably will, um, if you want to get in touch with me after the show, mm -hmm. uh, use the toll-free number eight seven seven four seven five two zero six two. You can send me an email. It's Jeff at TalkMoneyRadio dot com. Uh, or just um, go to the contact us uh, link on our website, www.andoveradvisorygroup.com. We don't use www anymore, right? No. That's just uh, andoveradvisorygroup.com. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, or you can just. Says the man who put up a QR code just, on, his, <laughs> on his show today. 
Are we still doing <laughs> www. <laughs> we don't have to say it. Right? Yeah. And um, or you can just uh, um, post a message on our Facebook page uh, if you have a comment or if you uh, you can private message us uh, if you have a question that you want to uh, get answered on the show or something you want to talk about. And I should mention that we do offer an initial uh, no obligation, uh, no cost uh, uh, consultation. It's important, um, and that's not an orientation or a timeshare deal. You're actually going to get some actionable intel on a problem that you're looking at. Exactly. Uh, and Which could be, by the way, bring in your last three tax returns, right? Yes. That's yeah. a great, yeah, that would yeah. be a great one. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, up until, oh, by the way, I, I didn't mention they postponed the, the start date. Uh, for filing. The IRS postponed the start date for filing, but they didn't postpone the due date, which is kind of odd to tell yeah. you. I have a feeling that that might change depending on how the virus, uh, 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 the virus impact uh, um, Last year they postponed and, it till June? No, July. July, yeah. Wasn't it July? It might have been, yeah. yeah. I think it was July. And so I have a feeling that, um, you know, depending on the, the uh, vaccine rollout and the um, uh, the virus, uh, how that all uh, plays out, they might end up uh, postponing it again. But we'll see. We'll see how that happens. Um, and so, um, I did want to just kind of finish up our discussion about um, some of the uh, financial pitfalls that you want to avoid um, in the in the coming year. And uh, we had parsed it out um, according to uh, age groups, and we didn't have time to finish up um, with those people. Uh, who are near and dear to my heart, the people in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, and so some of the things that you want to try to avoid, um, this happens a lot, Lou, um, co-signing loans for adult children. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be heartless. I know that, Lou. Yep. All right. But let me tell you, I can tell you personally, um, it can be it can be a hassle because you know what? They miss a payment. And you don't know because the bank isn't sending you a notification yep. until it's way overdue, uh, and then all of a sudden you got a ding on your you got a ding on your credit, right? Yep. So uh, co-signing really means you're a hundred percent on the hook if your child can't pay, right? Yep. Uh, a less than ideal situation um, as you're approaching retirement. You want to keep your uh, you want to keep your credit history pristine. Now, hey, there is one way to, to if you have done that, I understand. Um, you, you want to help out your kids as much as you possibly can, right? Sure. Um, and it's not so much that you wouldn't, you know, help them make a payment or two if if it if it uh, right. if, they, if they needed it. It's that it's that if it's late and you don't know it, that's when it can hurt you. Right. And so, and there is a way to check to make sure that that's uh, um, that that's uh, not affecting your credit, and that's to to uh, check your credit history on a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. um, another pitfall to avoid would be rating your retirement funds before. Retirement. Yeah. Um, you know, let's say you got um, involuntarily retired. Yes. Right. And uh, you're not 59 and a half yet and you can't start making uh, withdrawals from your on uh, your retirement accounts. You might be tempted to do so. Um, and the problem with that is that you're going to have to pay taxes on that, generally speaking, and yep. um, potentially a penalty on top of that. There are some exceptions. We utilize them a lot for our clients where you can you can avoid paying the penalty if you use the money for certain purposes. But just because you need it because you got laid off is not one of those. A wedding is not. One a of those wedding exceptions. is not one of those. A, a wedding is definitely not one of those. A boat exceptions. is not one of those. A boat <laughs> is definitely not one of those <laughs> exceptions. <laughs> yes. Um, and and so um, uh, we, we actually have um, recommended to clients who are eligible f uh, for uh, Social Security is that instead of pulling money out of their retirement accounts, they actually turn on their, their uh, social security, social security payments. Hmm. Um, and always uh, an interesting yeah, question. Right. When, when to stop paying. Right. Exactly. And yeah. there are, there are some things that you can do. Let's say, let's say it's just temporary. You, you might need it for a year or so. You're not sure about whether or not you're going back to work. And so you, you're struggling and, and maybe the market's not doing well and you're looking at those, those retirement accounts. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sell that. Hey, if you're if you're eligible, you might want to turn on your Social Security benefits. Yeah. There are ways that you can actually stop them. If for some reason you're not eligible to receive the full benefit because your income goes over a certain level, that's not a problem. It doesn't hurt you necessarily. Yep. Um, if for every month that you haven't collected your full Social Security benefit, a lot of people don't realize they add one more month to your actual retirement age. Mm -hmm. So you're not necessarily hurt because you started those those uh, uh, those uh, Social Security benefits. You can pay back too, right? 
within a certain time period. Within a certain time so period. So there's a limit. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. You can there's a do-over. But it's like a very limited window now. It used to be yeah. you could do it up until age 70 or something like that. But now it's a very limited window if you want to if you start them and you decide you want to stop them and pay all the money back. This is an interesting point because most people think the social security turn on date is a matter of uh, longevity, a matter of how long you think you're going to be getting payments and when it's worth it to turn them on. You don't think about protecting your retirement assets, though. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's an interesting part of the equation. Yeah. 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 And that might be just the amount, the, the money that you need just to get you through that, get you through that patch. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and one of the, I, I, one, one of the, the um, um, most important things that you can you can do uh, once you're in your 50s and 60s, if you haven't done so already, is put together an estate plan. Um, and um, that would be one of the things that maybe this year, if you haven't got to that or you haven't looked at it yep. in, in a few years, the kids have grown and, you know, your situation has changed dramatically. Maybe there's a new spouse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> possible, right? Okay. So the first question people are going to ask when you say that is who needs an, not who needs an estate plan, but people don't think they need, I don't have an estate. I don't need an estate plan. Right. So, you so I guess home. it's a bad word, right? Well, yeah, it's a, can be a misleading word. Misleading. Yeah. Yeah. So who are the people who need an estate plan? I think everybody needs this. I think yeah. everybody needs some sort of plan. The actual extent of that plan will, will be determined by your financial circumstances, yeah. right? But you own but a house, you have retirement assets, you yeah. need an estate plan. Yeah. And probably one of the most important documents, especially when you're in your 50s and 60s, in my opinion, uh, and the one that I talk about all the time with my clients is a durable power of attorney. Because um, we've seen it dozens of times where clients um, get sick, become incapacitated. A spouse is unable because they haven't given their spouse the legal ability uh -huh. to make decisions, yeah. business decisions on behalf of their, uh, on behalf of their spouse. And so now, uh, it's pilot. What, what do they do? Uh, your, your financial picture is pilotless, right? Potentially. Yeah. 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 So just because you're married doesn't give your spouse the ability to, 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 uh, um, take money out of a bank account that's only in your name. Right. Yep. But with a durable file of attorney, you have, you have given that authority to that individual mm -hmm. uh, that allows them to make those decisions on, on your behalf if, right. you, if you can't. Otherwise, it just becomes a big legal mess uh, where you can certainly gain that authority potentially, but it's just um, yeah. involved and, and expensive. Costly so, and time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you should have a will. Uh, definitely have that durable power of attorney. Healthcare proxies are important. Um, I think the, the, the durable power of attorney is just as important, if not more important, than the than the healthcare proxy. Um, Can you and, create those with multiple successors? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So you can go spouse and yeah. child or whoever would be yeah. next in line. Yeah. yeah. And I should say I'm not I'm not a lawyer and I can't yeah. I can't give legal advice um, and I can't uh, draw up any legal legal documents. So you're not the person. I'm not the person you're going to come to if you have to do that. But we do work with right. Uh, um, uh, many people who are uh, able to do that for you. And we can definitely refer you. We've had them on the show uh, in, in the past. And so actually we have, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have somebody on um, in the near future talking about this a little bit more detail, but that would be another financial pitfall that you want to avoid. That is to say, not having those, those documents or having those. So a lot of people say, ah, well, I you know my will is, uh, uh, I, or I don't, how, how, how does it go? I, I don't have a will, number one. A lot of people say I don't have a will. And I say, well, yeah, actually you do. Yeah. If you either wrote it or the or the state is going to write it for you. Because right. if you die intestate without a will, the, the state will has has one all set up ready to go for you. You're probably not going <laughs> to like the way, it, the, the, the way it works, but it's yeah. there. And um, a lot of folks think that just because he wrote a will 20 or 30 years ago, yeah. that somehow it's it's not it's not effective. But the last will that you signed... Well, that's your that's your will. So mm -hmm. it's it, you really should be taking a look at it to to make sure that it's still current. So the first wife will get the house, <laughs> possibly, or some asset that you didn't you know you yeah. you weren't thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely something that to um, uh, uh, to think about. So it looks like it looks like we're out of time, Lou. I'm glad I had a chance to get to, uh, get to that. But when we um, we'll be back next Monday, and I do. Uh, um, we're talking about the uh, the markets and where we are today and 
you know, comparing it to 1999 or 2000 and the dot com bubble burst thing. Yep. Um, and so I wanted to talk uh, again a little bit more about because this is we're in. The, let's say that you're retiring now. Yeah. And you're and you're and you're counting on your assets to 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 um, uh, provide a certain amount of income for you. And we and and you're invested aggressively and and uh, we have a uh, um, a situation like what occurred in in 2000. Yeah. Where does that leave you? And in trouble. What, yeah. And what we're talking about is um, um, sequence risk. And so I want to talk a little about that uh, more next week. But um, we'll have to we'll have to wait until uh, ne until next week to do that. In the meantime, uh, please remember try out the QR code. Get your get your taxes started. Give us a call. Yep. Uh, we're we're um, we're doing those initial consultations uh, virtually, so you don't have to leave the uh, comfort or privacy of your own home, and you don't have to worry about the uh, risk of infection either. That's right. Or insurrection. <laughs> or, or infection or insurrection. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I don't have to worry about either. <laughs> so until uh, until next week, remember, good sound advice is much better than advice that just sounds good. Thanks, Lou. Okay. Money.